This time of year is unlike any other in many respects. You know, it's a time of year when the air gets crisper, days get shorter, and, and many people prepare to celebrate the, the darkest, spookiest holiday of the year. Uh, there's a lot of controversy surrounding Halloween, but there's no denying its popularity in modern culture. Um, with an anticipated revenue of $8 billion this year alone, um, every, you know, shopping center and grocery store is just packed with candy and costumes and colorful, creepy decorations um, in just a, a few days. And yes, I did say in the bulletin that it's Wednesday and it's actually Thursday. I don't know my days of the week, um, but in just a few short days, Children will be parading up and down the street, uh, wearing, you know, dresses their favorite characters and saying trick or treat as they hand out, um, you know, plastic molded pumpkins or in my day we use pillowcases and tried to fill the pillowcase to the brim um, with uh, in hopes of collecting vast amounts of candy. And of course, all that candy is going to get eaten mostly in one night and then result in a stomach ache the next day. Uh, at least that's always what happens at our house. Um, but, you know, for Christians, Halloween can be a, a difficult holiday. Um, for instance, Adam Carroll wrote into Reader, Reader's Digest one year saying, my six-year-old son was really excited about his Halloween costume. And he runs up to his dad and says, Dad, I'm going to be the pulp. <laughs> And his dad said, Ian, you can't be the Pope. We're, we're Lutheran. We're not Catholic. <laughs> and so Ian hadn't thought about that before, and he, he started considering his alternatives. And after a few minutes, he, he turned back to his dad and he said, Dad, is Dracula Lutheran? <laughs> Uh, well, beyond just trying to choose the right costume, Halloween uh, can be a bit troublesome for Christians. You know, its darker side is, is disconcerting for some, you know, haunted houses, ghosts and goblins, monsters and mayhem. Uh, some even call it the devil's holiday. And yet it holds a bit of charm for us, you know, as we remember our own childhood experiences with the day, you know, bobbing for apples, trick-or-treating, or dressing up as princesses and superheroes. You know, some churches hold uh, alternative, like, fall festivals or harvest celebrations, careful not to use the word Halloween in the title. Uh, and other, you know, many Christians just staunchly oppose Halloween on the, the grounds that it supports Satan worship or, you know, pagan practices. And this places many of us, especially those with children, in, in an awkward situation, how should we as Christians respond to this holiday? Is it satanic and sinister or just fun and games? Is it a problem or a potential opportunity? Haunted or holy? Well, to answer that question, uh, I want to start by looking at the story of Halloween. Let's talk about Halloween's story a little bit. Now, first, we do need to recognize that that the modern celebration of Halloween draws heavily from uh, Celtic uh, practices and superstitions that uh, predate Christianity, and they're, they're rooted in the Celtic feast of Samhain. Uh, while modern Halloween celebrations can be viewed as nights of rollicking fun and eerie games, its pagan beginnings were much less innocent. You know, originally November 1st, was a celebration of the Druids in honor of this Sam Hain character whom they believed to be the Lord of the Dead. And the Druids believed that on the eve of this festival, on October 31st, Sam Hain, the Lord of the Dead, called together all of the wicked souls that had been condemned to roam the earth over the past year, and the veil between the spiritual world and the physical world was pierced, and, and you know, just witches and demons and hobgoblins and everything were released en masse to harass the living. And interestingly, they, they thought that the cat was sacred because they thought cats, especially black cats, uh, had once been humans whose spirits were transferred to the cat as punishment for their evil deeds. So like if you saw a black cat, that was you know, letting you know that there was some evil human spirit consigned to live within that cat, which kind of makes me wonder why they were sacred. Like wouldn't you just want to kill that cat then and you know, get it out of the way? I don't know. 
But, uh, but that's, of course, why black cats are often associated today with, with Halloween. There was a prevailing belief among many nations that, you know, at death, the souls of good people were taken by good spirits to a good place, you know, like heaven. Um, but the spirits of bad people were simply consigned to wander the earth, or they, they were put inside the, the bodies of animals like, like cats. Um, and, and so... Typically, the Druids believe that on this one night of the year, October 31st, the night before the Samhain festival, the spirits of all of these, these dead spirits that are roaming the earth returned to their original homes, like they wanted to go back to the place from whence they came, um, and they brought with them other ghosts and goblins and stuff like that. So in order to protect themselves or, or make themselves immune to the attacking ghosts, people disguise themselves as witches or goblins or ghosts themselves, and they would trick the ghosts into thinking that, like, hey, I'm one of you, so leave me alone, don't, don't mess with me. And so that's where the tradition of dressing up in scary costumes on October 31st originated. Um, they also attempted to ward off these evil spirits by carving scary or grotesque faces in various gourds, and they would put those all around their house to try and ward off those evil spirits. And they would, you know, of course, put the candle inside to light them up and make them flicker and look even more scary. And, of course, that's where the, the custom of carving jack-o'-lanterns comes from. And in order to placate the evil spirits, they would often put out a bowl of various treats, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts, snack foods uh, for the most part is what they, they would use. And it was believed that if the, the ghosts or the spirits were satisfied with your offering, you know, if they showed up at your house and they saw a bowl full of snacks, they would eat the snacks and then they would leave you alone. And, uh, and if you didn't put out your bowl of treats or whatever else, or, or maybe you didn't put out good enough treats, that they would trick you by uh, wreaking havoc on your home that evening, kind of like, like poltergeist. You know, books would fly off the shelves and lights would flicker and, and all sorts of stuff like that. And so the tradition of trick or treat was born. And despite its sinister and, and superstitious origins, uh, I think we can learn a lot from how early Christians responded to this Samhain festival. You know, as Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire in Europe, uh, many pagans, even Druids, converted to Christianity. Uh, but they were still very superstitious, and they didn't have Bibles back then that they could read, and most of them were illiterate anyway. So without proper education, many of these new believers brought their old superstitions with them into the church, including their belief in ghosts and goblins and whatnot. Now, in order to, to better educate these new or young believers, the church established a rival celebration and designated November 1st as All Saints Day. And rather than, you know, fearing the onslaught of evil spirits, All Saints Day was dedicated to celebrating and remembering the saints who had passed away during that year. So any Christians who had died, especially martyrs who had died for the last 12 months, they held a special service, sort of like a, uh, you know, a celebration of life service, remembering those people on All Saints Day. And the Mass, or the church service that was held the night before that, on October 31st, was known as All Hollow Mass, or the Holy Mass, the Holy Church Service. And uh, October 31st itself, that evening, became known as All Halloween, or Halloween. Uh, and thus, Halloween is actually a Christian name, meaning Holy Evening. And All Hallows' Eve was an attempt on the part of Christianity to overwhelm the tradition of ghosts and ghouls with the truth of the gospel. And in my opinion, it was largely successful. You know, even though many of these Celtic traditions uh, have persisted throughout time, they've been radically altered. You know, the, um, the pagan... Uh, 
motivation and meaning behind the traditions that, that we still have as part of our, our modern holiday celebration have been all but obliterated. Uh, I mean, nobody carves pumpkins today and puts them outside their house because they think they're warding off evil spirits. And we don't dress up in costumes because we're trying to fool some goblin into thinking that we're one of them. You know, we, we do it to, to have fun. And, and, you know, we don't put out treats for evil spirits that are coming to harass us. We put them out for children which isn't all that different, I suppose. <laughs> but, but the traditions have, have dramatically changed, and so even though there's still an element of their influence involved, uh, Christianity, as this Christian worldview and understanding of life and death and the spirit and afterlife and stuff like that, as that became more prominent and prevailed, these you know, Celtic superstitions and other beliefs just sort of faded into obscurity. So with the story of Halloween in mind, let me share some scriptures that I think are very relevant to Halloween, some Halloween scriptures. In other words, what does the Bible say about this? Uh, and obviously, we, you know, we can't just look up the word Halloween in the back of your Bible and hope to find some verse that mentions it. Um, Halloween wasn't invented until well after the Bible was written. But I do think that there, there are some scriptures that are especially relevant to this subject. If you have a Bible and you want to follow along, by the way, go ahead and open up to Romans chapter 14. I should have told you that earlier. Romans 14. Uh, and Paul writes there, this is kind of a lengthy passage, but he begins in chapter 1, uh, and we're going to read on through verse 8, or uh, chapter, verse 1 of chapter 14, we're going to read through verse 8. He says, Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another, another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. And whoever eats meat does so to the Lord. For they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone. And none of us dies for ourselves alone. We, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Here in this passage, we not only discover who the true Lord of the dead is, but Paul also addresses two specific issues that I think are, are relevant to the subject of Halloween. The, the first what had to do with meat that had been sacrificed to pagan gods. Uh, most of the meat in the Agora, which is the Roman marketplace, uh, so when you went to the market to go buy meat, most of the meat had been previously sacrificed to pagan gods like Zeus or Aphrodite or someone like that before it was butchered and sent to the market. Uh, and there were many new believers who, as I mentioned earlier, brought their old superstitious beliefs with them when they became Christians. Uh, many Roman or Gentile converts, even though they accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, still believed in the gods of Roman and Greek mythology. And therefore, they refused to eat the meat that had been sacrificed to those gods because they thought that would be worshiping those gods, and they didn't want to have anything to do with that. Um, in fact, Paul, this wasn't just a problem in the city of Rome, it was a problem all across the empire, and he addresses the same issue in his letter to the Corinthians. He, he tells them in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, we all know that an idol is not really a god, and there is only one god. However, not all believers know this. Some are accustomed to thinking of idols as being real. So when they eat food that has been offered to idols, they think of it as the worship of real gods, and their weak consciences are violated. 
See, these were, Paul refers to these as weaker Christians because they still believed in all of these other untrue myths and stories about these various other gods. The stronger Christians, uh, those who were more mature in their faith, realized that gods like Zeus and Hermes and Athena, etc., didn't even exist, and therefore they didn't have a problem eating the meat that had been sacrificed to those gods. But when these weaker Christians saw these stronger Christians eating meat that had been sacrificed to gods, boy, they got upset about it. And so it caused this big division in the church between those who would eat meat and those who didn't. Now, the second issue that Paul addresses in Romans 14 pertained to holidays. Some Christians wanted to celebrate special holidays, and other Christians, uh, and the holidays that they're probably referring to here would be, you know, Jewish holidays like Passover or Hanukkah or other things like that. Um, but other Christians believe that, you know, the holidays were irrelevant, that we don't need to celebrate. Every day is the same. We just worship God on Sunday, and then we go home, and, and there's no need to have these extra special holidays that we, we celebrate. And, and so this too created division in the church. You know, they were arguing and debating over whether or not they should recognize and celebrate these holidays. And Paul's solution to both of these contentious issues is found in Romans 15, verse 7, where he says simply, accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. He tells the Christians who eat meat sacrificed to pagan gods, not to condemn or judge those who don't, and vice versa. And the same goes for those who celebrate special holidays and those who don't. Ultimately, he says, you're all trying to honor God in different ways. Now, if we take these two examples and put them together, I think we get a very clear scriptural standpoint for this controversy over Halloween. Halloween is a holiday and it was once dedicated to a pagan god. You know, their issues here were things dedicated to pagan gods and holidays, and that's what was dividing them. And here we have the case where we have a holiday that was once dedicated to pagan gods. And, and so some people today understand that there's no such thing as ghosts and goblins and Sam Hain and the Festival of the Dead are nothing more than ignorant superstitions, and therefore have no problem celebrating the modern version of Halloween. Others believe that Halloween's dubious origins and its focus on scary supernatural stuff makes it something in which Christians should not be involved, that we should abstain from this. And I believe that Paul would tell us exactly the same thing that he told the Christians in Rome. If it bothers your conscience, don't participate. If, on the other hand, you can celebrate Halloween in a way that, that honors and glorifies God like the early Christians did, then go for it. But whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Don't live for yourself. Live for Jesus. So the question becomes then, how can we use Halloween to honor and glorify God? Well, let me offer a few suggestions for Halloween. These are my Halloween suggestions. In my opinion... The worst thing Christians can do on Halloween is just turn off the lights and pretend nobody's home. Um, Jesus said that the, his purpose in coming to earth was to seek and save the lost, and that's our purpose and mission too. Um, he says in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, let your lights shine before men in such a way that they will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I suggest that we take Jesus' suggestion seriously and let our light shine, both our spiritual lights and our porch lights, on a night that is typically known for darkness. Um, and, and let me offer a few specific suggestions for how we can use Halloween as a way to glorify God. Number one, don't ignore it. Halloween won't go away, so if you're not a fan of Halloween, determine to turn a negative into a positive. Um, number two, if you have children, don't take fun away from them. Go trick-or-treating with them, but take some gospel tracks with you when you go. I mean, think about this. This is the one night of the year, the, probably the only opportunity in the entire year where you can go door to door all throughout town and everybody will answer the door in a cheerful mood. 
I, there's no other opportunity in your life to do this. And so when you, know, you take your kids trick-or-treating and somebody opens the door and they put some kid, candy in your kid's basket, you can say thank you and hand them a gospel tract saying, Here, this is for you, thank you so much, and then just move on to the next door. It's such an easy way to try and share the gospel in a non-confrontational situation. Um, number three... If you're on the opposite end of that, if you're the person that's staying home and you're handing out candy, et cetera, or you're going to be answering the door, for one, buy good candy. Um, because then more people will want to come to your house. They'll be like, I remember when I was a kid, everybody knew that one house that handed out full-size candy bars. You guys remember that? <laughs> and everybody would, I'm making sure I hit that place twice tonight. I'll go home, change costumes, come back. Um, so hand out good candy. But in addition to that, you know, maybe hand out some information about the church. You know, our, uh, I have one of our church magnets up here. These things are perfect for just dropping into a bucket of candy. It'll eventually wind up on somebody's refrigerator, and then that family has information about our church because their kid came to your house on Halloween. Um, number four, if you're not a big fan of, like, the scary, grotesque-looking pumpkins, buy a pumpkin and carve a cross into it. Um, put a candle inside and then set that outside your house as a way to symbolize that Jesus is the light of the world and that he's the light within us. Um, number five, pray. Pray for the safety of the kids that are going to be wandering around that night uh, and, and pray that, that, more importantly, that the gospel goes out that night as well. Um, and number six, and this is really more of an appeal than a suggestion, please participate and our church's trunk or treat event <laughs> on Halloween. Um, as Dusty and Ashley and others have announced all, all month long, we're going to be lining up our trunks here in Palmyra at the park. We're partnering with other churches this year to try and make it a bigger and better event. Of course, the weather did not take that into account, um, and so we're looking at some very cold temperatures and possibly some snow. But I don't want that to scare people away um, because it's really important for us to try and share the gospel and be a light in our community for Christ. Um, and we're going to have, in addition to, to giving away candy, we're going to be giving away Christian comic books and gospel tracts, and we're going to have hay rides and a bonfire, and I think there's going to be a hay maze and live music and all sorts of stuff. So please, in order for this event to be successful and to make an impact on our community, we need as many people there with their cars parked and their trunks open, handing out candy to the kids who come through. And, and if we do it well, they'll keep coming back year after year after year because they want to participate in this, and, and hopefully we can draw more and more people to Christ. Um, there's always going to be those who use special events like Halloween for menacing purposes. You know, teenagers who toilet paper houses or, or, you know, vandalize businesses or experiment with Ouija boards or witchcraft. That sort of thing doesn't make Halloween inherently evil. It just reveals the sinful nature of the human heart. Um, people will use any excuse to practice evil, and it's our job to overwhelm evil with good, um, to overwhelm the tradition of ghosts and goblins with the truth of God's goodness and grace. In the end, the, the trick, I think, is to treat Halloween as an opportunity to tell people about Jesus, who is not only the true Lord of the dead, but the Lord of the living, too. I like the story about Halloween that Lori Beth Jones tells in her book, Grow Something Besides Old. Uh, she talks about one Halloween night when she underestimated the number of trick-or-treaters that she was going to have. Anybody else have that happen to them? And she runs out of candy early, so in desperation, she you know, empties out her change jar, and she's dropping nickels and dimes and quarters in, in kids' buckets as they come to the door. And one little girl in particular, maybe about five years old, uh, shows up and and she has this uh, pretty, like, princess, uh, fairy princess dress on, and she's got, like, a cute little crown and a wand and everything. Um, and, and so Lori Beth Jones drops a couple of quarters into her bucket, and she says, I've run out of candy, but tomorrow you can take these coins to the store, and you can turn them into candy. And the little princess looked at her wand and looked back, and she said, Lady, this isn't a real wand. <laughs> Well, like that wand, ghosts and goblins may not be real, and Sam Hain certainly isn't the Lord of the Dead, but there is a real 
spiritual realm out there, full of devils and demons and depravity. Paul called it this present darkness. And it's our job to shine the light of Jesus to dispel that darkness. So if you'd like to join me in doing so, please uh, come talk to me. You can pull me aside after church or you can uh, call me at home or just come forward now while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.